It was an adventure arriving here, and my just political message for everyone <laughs> is please help train employee community unionize if you have an opportunity to vote for that. And please also support the um, publicization or nationalization of our railway lines. They're privately owned. So when trains break down and you're trying to do the right thing for the climate and transport your body in responsible ways, sometimes you can't get to where you need to go. And that was my journey trying to arrive. And I interviewed everyone on the train to figure out what the holes were. And the employees told me those two things. We need unions so we don't work over 12 and a half hours. And we really need the railway lines like they are in the rest of the world to be owned by the government. So those are my two messages <laughs> next time. <laughs> yes. Um, I will be here on time if we get those things done. <laughs> so, um, fiber shed. Um, so this is a, a project in which many of you are really familiar with because I know that there's people in the audience who are doing this work every day in their home communities and um, I'm going to go through my Genesis story, which resembles a lot of people in the audience's Genesis story. And then I'm going to talk about some projects that are very multi-stakeholder. Um, I don't have a background in fashion. I, I, I love our second skin. I love what it does for my ability to survive and thrive. But I don't, you know, wearing old hiking boots and very, very mended, very old garments, and um, which I guess is coming back into fashion. But uh, my background really is about um, ecological sensitivity and thinking through material culture as tethered to the ecology of a place. And place-based work, in my experience, being committed to a landscape, committed to a place, is the most direct way to know how to solve problems that we face in our climate conversation. It's the most direct way to solve critical issues of democracy. Um, it's a, a place to form bipartisanship around core issues. I'm getting choked up, sorry. Um, so Fibershed is that place. Um, for me, I'm a fifth generation member of a watershed in California um, that is near the Pacific Ocean north of San Francisco, um, it's Coast Miwok territory. And we work in 51 counties now. And this strategic geography is what I've really committed my life's work to. And I'm thinking about this strategic geography in terms of water, food, fiber, fuel, all of the things that I would rely on as a human being to thrive and survive, hopefully survive first and then thrive. And I think about fashion as very much a, a space which I would love to see return to its understanding of that which holds it up, uh, that which engenders its ability to exist. And that is the land and that is the soil. So in 2000, Nine, I was, I was taking airplanes at the time, and I was studying all of the work of natural dyers across North America, and I was watching troops go um, during the Obama administration up to Afghanistan in the name of really what I could see was more militarism to secure the distribution of fossilized carbon. Uh, that's really what it ended up being and what most of our military exploits are about is resources. And I realized that my concern over that militarization was, was manifesting too on the material culture. I'm sitting in a plastic chair, my clothes are plastic. The fuel to get me home is, is this fossilized carbon. Everything I'm touching, wearing, depending on is from a source of material culture that is not engendering a peaceful world. And so I started to think through, oh, well, here I am studying the natural dye traditions in North America. I'm not wearing these natural dyes head to toe. I'm still not fully, almost. <laughs> um, but how can I go home and use myself as a guinea pig to test the waters of what it means to commit to a bioregion and not have to extract from other bioregions? So this sweater kind of sums up a lot of what this one year challenge was, was to wear clothing for you know, bathing suits, socks, 
um, shirts, pants that were sourced from the soil in these counties. So pastures, rangelands, croplands, working with artists, designers, makers in the community, building out this wardrobe that ended up with about 33 pieces. I don't know who mentioned 33 pieces <laughs> earlier. It's a magic number, 33. Um, that, that's what I ended up with, and, but that was socks and underwear too. And that was what I wore for a year, and it really tethered me to that land in a way that I had never experienced prior. Even being multi-generational, um, understanding the landscape, understanding the hydrology, understanding precipitation patterns, um, demographics, I got a whole new lens cast on the land. And it was a lens that helped me understand the back roads to get to a 10-acre farm that had 60 sheep. I knew how to get off the freeway and take a much longer route to get to where I needed to go through landscapes that had been ignored or erased in some way from the idea of fashion or the idea of material culture. So this is Robin Lined and Casey Dapp. Um, that sweater shirt was knit by Casey, who rode her bike for two days from San Francisco to get to the farm. <laughs> she just wanted to understand the landscape as I did and I paid her as a student to make this piece with Robin Lyons Jacob's Wool, and this is a heritage breed. And Robin lives on 10 acres, and she rotationally grazes beautifully about 60 head of these Jacob's sheep. And she used to be um, a dairy woman, and then she is really sized down, and she is an amazing weaver, she is an amazing yarn maker, she is an amazing shepherdess, and that's her pairing with a very young design student from an urban community building out the sweater that I wore for a year. The other thing I started to understand was what many of us understand. The magic middle is missing from American manufacturing. We can see the soil where we grow things, but, and we can see finished garments, but what's happening in between? That process has been erased for the most part in many cases. I was able to find milling equipment from the 19-teens and the 1920s that had been left in old barns and were being reconstituted at the time by a woman in her mid-80s named Jane Deemer, who then left the mill to Mark Hale Williams. If you're on our Instagram, <laughs> you can see the inheritor of this equipment in a reel. Um, she's showing how she washes wool in a retrofitted laundry system. It's very hands-on. It's very much a Rosie the Riveter kind of operation where she's fabricating parts to fix these machines. But this is how I got yarn to make the sweater shirt you saw. And this equipment is still there, still being operated by a woman now in her mid-30s. The next generation of manufacturers is emerging. And Merkel went to California College of the Arts and studied fashion. And now she runs a wool mill. So at the end of this year, I kept meeting these amazing designers. Sierra also went to um, California College of the Arts. Um, and Diane Ashby um, was a jeweler who I worked with who was living in Oakland at the time. And you see Sierra wearing all of this color-grown cotton, undyed, just the cotton that grows in the field in the Cape Hay Valley, um, which is 90 miles from where I live. Um, these pieces were actually from historic fabrics that the cotton farmer, who many of you know, Sally Fox, had had manufactured in the 90s before the mills went away. She saved the fabric. <laughs> so we used some of the fabric in pieces. And this was a fashion show that we had at the end of the season. I don't know if the pointer works, um, but this is oak gall dyed with iron on brown cotton. And the jewelry, all those of you who've taken dye workshops, you end up with little bits of yarn that are all dyed different colors. So that was her response to taking dye workshops for a year, was wrapping these um, materials around a wool cord and making jewelry out of all of her dye workshop samples. So that's madder root, indigo, marigold, coreopsis. Those are all the flowers and roots that provide that color um, on wool that's from Mark Hale's, who's from that mill. So as I was doing this work, 
I kind of had to figure out too <laughs> some things about what I was really, there's cycles that were nested in all of us sitting here today. There's this community cycle that I became highly exposed to through like, dressing myself for one year in these clothes. And then there was this consciousness that evolved about this other cycle that was bigger than me and quite invisible. And it's a cycle that we're living and breathing as we sit here today with every out breath and every in breath. And that is the carbon cycle. And I started to look at this work because I was happened to be working with biogeochemists from UC Berkeley who were in my community at the time doing an analysis of the rangelands where all the sheep were grazing and trying to understand if these landscapes that are working landscapes, lands where the fiber comes from, if they could actually be a solution to climate change. This was 2007 when they started their work. I met them in 2009, 2010. And they started to help me think about this thing I learned about in seventh grade, photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. But how is photosynthesis connected to fashion? And that is now more commonly described, I see in some of the new technologies. But this is an ancient technology, and we have to kind of remind ourselves, carbon capture is going on all the time. All of the grass outside this room that's starting to green up is photosynthesizing. And what does that mean? It's using the energy, the photovoltaic energy, the photo energy of the sun, photovoltaic energy of the sun, to ignite the ability for the grass to absorb a CO2 molecule from the atmosphere. The energy from the sun is then able to help that plant break the CO2 molecule. The plant takes the C, the carbon, moves it into its structure and builds the grass out of the C that was once, once the air. So it's, it's gas to mass, all ignited by the energy of the sun. A sheep could come along and take that grass, eat it, digest it in its rumen, turn out a really wonderful nutrient for the microbes in the soil, and transform that carbon that was once coming out of the air into a protein. The grass itself is just a carbohydrate. You eat carbohydrates, you wear carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are just water and carbon. Cotton is a carbohydrate. Hemp is a carbohydrate. All of it is atmospheric carbon that has very recently been turned into some kind of mass. And I was thinking about that, reflecting back on my origin story of this lithosphere-based carbon that most of my clothes were completely dependent upon. And so a lot of the scientific community right now is trying to understand how we as humans can become awake to photosynthesis. Some scientists say an increase with photosynthetic carbon capture increasing 5% on the planet would help us draw down and offset industrial emissions. There's some big numbers out there which I'll show you through some of the scientists. CSU has some of the best award-winning scientists actually here, Keith Postian and team. Um, your Comet team who makes the Comet model for the USDA. We use a lot of the work that comes out of CSU to model the carbon impact of transforming working lands into carbon sinks. And this is all doable and there's a lot of great science around it. But I point to this cycle just to remind ourselves it's ancient. By ignoring it, we ignore it at our peril. By harmonizing with it, we create a beautiful future. So how does it work very quickly? I found this really fascinating. So there's the sheep. <laughs> sheep eats, in that case, forbs and grass that have very recently absorbed atmospheric carbon to create their structure. Some of that carbon actually gets released into the ground as a sugar. Some of that carbon will end up on the ground and it will become, through the activity of earthworms, particulate carbon. It'll then move into aggregate associated carbon through the decomposition occurring through bacteria and worms. And eventually, we hope that through these different pathways, carbon pathways, that the soil can recarbonize itself. Now in my state, we've lost half the carbon in our soils due to colonization, the overgrazing of livestock in fact, and the annualization of the grasslands. Moving away from perennials 
to annuals, which happened when we brought the European oat in. So we need to, when people say let's decarbonize society, I'm like, no, <laughs> decarbonize the atmosphere as much as you can right now, but recarbonize the soil because this is the one place where we need it. One of the fastest ways to tighten the carbon cycle is actually to use the very animals that can become detrimental if allowed to overgraze. Ruminant animals. Animals that have the ability to turn grass into mass, grass into wool, grass into leather. These are animals, and you don't have to sign up for using those materials, but the role of herbivores and ruminants is 30 million years old. Like we have a very long ecological history of animals helping us cycle carbon on grasslands. And so they create through their rumen a manure that dissolves so easily into the soil. And it activates something called the microbial carbon pump. So one of my big passions right now is how do we work to accentuate the microbial carbon pump? How does fashion accelerate microbes to do that thing that they do best, which is to accelerate exchanges in the soil and to help plants get the nutrients they need to become bigger, stronger, disease resistant, drought tolerant, frost tolerant, and to keep photosynthesizing. The more those plants are photosynthesizing, the better humanity is off in terms of our climate conversation. Animals have a big role in this. And so, Basic Climate 101, we know that we need net negative emissions. Uh, James Hansen wrote this paper, Our Children's Burden in 2013. It's not just our smokestacks and our tailpipes and what we think of as industrial civilization. The plastics, the cars, the buildings, like all of that obviously has an emission scenario that we have to curb. So when people say net zero, it's like, yeah, we have net zero in smokestacks and tailpipes, but now we've waited a little too long, and now we need net negative emissions in concert with smokestacks and tailpipes also going to net zero. You need net zero, and you need negative emissions. And this is well known. Dr. Ratan Lal has said that net negative emissions in our working lands actually are very, very possible in that the amount of land we have not paved over, the amount of land that is still in agricultural production, that is still in its natural state, has the ability, if we enhance photosynthesis, and we ha I'll show you how that looks in some of our working lands, we can draw down an average of 2.45 petagrams. A petagram is a billion tons. If we do that drawdown of a 2.45 petagram per carbon per year globally, by 2100, we could be at atmospheric CO2E levels that are lower than in our industrial levels when we started this whole experiment of extracting fossil fuel. So every time you breathe in, take an inhale, you're taking in around 419 parts per million of CO2E right now. If we dialed the clock back to the mid 1700s, your breath would have around 265, maybe, parts per million of CO2. So you're, you're literally inhaling more CO2 by orders of magnitude more CO2 than we would have as humans pre-industrial revolution. So if we can get to removing this much due to enhancing, and this is also restoring wetlands places that needed, that were deforested to reforest. Um, it's a matter of natural and working lands being restored. It is centering nature-based solutions in this conversation to achieve this. But I would love to live in a world where we are at pre-industrial CO2e levels and we have stabilized Holocene temperatures. I would sleep better at night, which is not the only reason to do this work, <laughs> is about seeing a future for all of us on this planet. And, the sim and again, nature-based solutions, this future does not rely simply on new technologies. A lot of it relies on harmonizing with bigger earth cycles. The human is a keystone species. We have this beautiful opposable thumb. 
We function in a very powerful way on this planet. Honor your role as a keystone species. You have the power to do so much good. And we know through indigenous technologies that have lasted for 25,000 years in the Amazon, some argue 13,000 years in Coast Miwok territory where I am, we know humans have tightened and harmonized regenerative cycles on this planet and produced material culture and high standards of living for their people. So the studies are out. Our history tells us certain things are possible. So when I look to our current agricultural system, 23% of global emissions come from ag. Ag is a net emitter. Ag is the one thing in the world, though, it's the one economic sector that has the ability to be a net sink because it depends on soil and it's a biologically based part of our economy. These are the practices that we have known since the Great Dust Bowl that actually mitigate the, the soil losses. But not only do they mitigate soil losses, these are practices that build soil organic carbon. There's something called general systems theory. The world works in an interesting way. If you ignite an ecosystem to behave in a certain way, you give it certain inputs, you can either have that ecosystem have positive feedback loops. So each, the input you give it initially, you can kind of step back and it starts a feedback loop that ascends. Or you can stimulate an ecosystem in a degenerative way and it will descend through feedback loops. They call them positive feedback loops. These are, fee these are inputs or anthropogenic technologies that create ascending spirals in our landscapes. Systems that start to regenerate on their own capacity. So when people say regenerative agriculture, I'm like, okay, well how many inputs is it taking you to regenerate that system? Because really we should have a system where you need very little energy in and you're getting lots of energy out. That's thermodynamics at work in its most honest and beautiful way. So back to the human level here. <laughs> what does this look like back to my experience trying to wear these clothes for a year? I started to realize that my clothes obviously were coming from the soils I was walking, soils I was smelling, soils that I was becoming familiar with. Are they degrading or are they regenerating? All of this was becoming conscious to me. To me. And then I thought about how many of these rangelands I was working on were so degraded. And so we did an experiment with those biogeochemists I was talking about, where they dusted a quarter inch layer of organic amended compost onto those rangelands. They saw 2,000 pounds of atmospheric carbon per acre drawn into that landscape for one year per acre, just with a quarter inch dusting of compost. They went back and measured the second year. They didn't reapply the quarter inch. And a rangeland, by the way, is unirrigated, grazed land, grassland. The landscape did it again, 2,000 more pounds. Went back again, 2,000 more pounds. They did the computer modeling, 30 years, up to 100 years, this rangeland has been stimulated to start drawing carbon down at greater levels. It was emitting carbon, then it became a net sink. A quarter inch dusting of compost? We can do that. <laughs> we have 63 million hectares of land in California in that land use type. We could easily be producing that much compost. But then the question was, where are we gonna get all the compost from? And that was a problem. We are not managing life yet in our society in a way where we're returning that carbon back to where it belongs. Circular economies hinging on biological activity is what we really need. And I know it's gonna get talked about tomorrow. <laughs> we need systems, people often say, well, why would clothing, why would you compost your clothes? Is that the highest and best use? You talk to people in compost, people in soil health work, and they're like, yes, we need your carbon, bring it over here. So don't think of composting your clothing as the lowest common denominator in a circular economic conversation. Certainly we wanna mend our clothing. <laughs> we wanna keep it in play. 
We want to recycle it if that recycling system is nearby and we're not transporting it using maritime bunker fuel across the world just to shred it and re-spin it. Doing LCA work, life cycle assessment work, which was brought up today in the room that I was in, is a really important analysis to provide to how we actually cycle this carbon. Your clothing is just carbon. It either came from the fossilized system, that it was extracted through fracked gas or oil extraction, or you're wearing fresh carbon. If you're wearing fresh carbon that came from an agricultural process, cotton, hemp, wool, cashmere, linen, we can turn that into microbe food and excite that microbial carbon pump. So soil to soil is a very critical aspect of how I think about circularity because the soil needs your food, not just your food waste, but your clothing and your shoes too. <laughs> So I wanted to bring up, um, so Nali and I talked about multi-stakeholder partnerships, because again, I can share with you this great work that's been housed in academia, it's been on my body, I've been a guinea pig, but how are we affecting change in the greater community amongst textile companies? So in the San Joaquin Valley, which is really the backyard of San Francisco, we produce $50 billion a year of agricultural product we grow 136,000 acres of cotton. Cotton is the second lowest water user in our state. We grow 1.3 million acres of almonds that are exported primarily to China. So we have this very strong export economy for nuts. We have a shrinking cotton sector. And we have a cotton sector that gets blamed for what the almond sector is doing. <laughs> Cotton gets blamed for everything. And it's really fascinating to go in and create something called the California Cotton and Climate Coalition. Most people think it's an oxymoron. It is not. <laughs> and there's um, natural fiber, fiber welding is in the room, and you're going to hear tomorrow from them. Uh, they are one of our teammates. Reformation, uh, Koyuchi, Outer Known, natural fiber welding. Um, a larger athletic company who will launch later this year, we, who can't be named yet. Um, help me out, who are we missing here in our team? Imperial Yarn Circular Systems. There's 10 brands. Oh, Carhartt. We are all teamed up to help these growers, working with an academics, Dr. Cindy Daly, to understand what it means to start growing cotton. Here are our trial plots. Here's our soil regenerating <laughs> cotton, and here is our conventional cotton, and we have 64 acres side-by-side -side trial. The growers are learning so much in the trial, they've already expanded to 500 acres in year two, uh, year three, again. And the brands are working together to put price incentives into the farmer's pocket that cover the cost of cover crop, reducing the chemistries, and in one case, We've totally eliminated Roundup. We have reduced defoliants this year by 25%. And again, why am I working in conventional cotton? Because that's all California has, minus 100 acres of organic. So with 136,000 acres at stake, with the crop dusting and the boom sprayers, this is for every crop. It's not just cotton getting these treatments. We have so much work to do to clean up these systems. And these brands are right in there, providing exactly what the grower needs to make the changes, like per penny. It's beautiful work. And then the brands are working together. Um, so they come to the farms, building relationships, having brands come, learn about the cotton field. We have a book club. <laughs> we hide nothing. <laughs> like, you need to read these books about the history of water in California colonization, understand what this land has been through, because people want to go to market and say, it's regenerative. And I'm like, do you know what that's going to take? That's some, you know, we can't just solve what colonization created in one growing season. We can't solve the chemical input economy in one growing season. So I think where I, what I ask from society is kind of like, patience with the grower, even though we feel like we have no time left and we have so much work to do, our agricultural community is not digital. 
They need us to have a kind of empathy and patience because they have been under more economic pressure than anyone in the supply chain. They receive 4% of the value of a finished good. A brand will receive up to 75% of the value of a finished good. Growers have almost no margin to work with, so when we call on them to be perfect, and this way and that way, every grower I say, I, I talk to says, growers are like, do you think I want to spray? I'm like, I don't know, do you want to spray? Of course I don't want to spray. <laughs> if I don't get this yield, I can't afford to keep my employees employed. So everything is this very, very sensitive subject of, of cost. So what the C4 brands are paying for is this. What conventional cotton is paying for is this. What's happening in the research is the microbial carbon pump is being ignited. Those are sheep. Those are sheep grazing down a multi-species cover crop in the late spring in Los Banos, California. Here, the land has been fallow for four months. Wind has been eroding it. Carbon has been entering the air. When you see California dust storms from NASA's satellite, it's because in our winter, we're leaving the ground like this because the cost of cover crop is considered too expensive. <laughs> the cost of animal integration is considered too expensive. And when we interview the farmers about what this is like, they're like, God, you're asking us to manage all this new life. I'm like, more life on the farm is great. And they're like, yeah, it's really complicated. <laughs> we love it, but like, we haven't had to manage life like this before. They're used to controlling things with mechanics and chemistry, and now we're asking them to use the force of nature. And it's a really fascinating process. Um, here's Koyuchi with their first climate beneficial cotton. And we say climate beneficial because we are measuring directly the soil and watching carbon increases in that soil and knowing that through causality of price premiums, we are changing the drawdown in these soils. And through that increase, moving from beyond business as usual to something additional, we measure the delta and we give benefit of that narrative of climate beneficial to the brands going to market because they caused the change. And they are making products where that soil that they contributed to financially is tethered to. So that's a duvet with all the cotton we couldn't use in the textile used in the fluff. Tampons, another great product to make from cotton that you can't use in a textile. So to have your coalition built with feminine hygiene products, bedding, and then natural fiber weldings, Miriam. Do you have your shoes on? <laughs> That is a plant, you'll say more about it, but plant-based uh, material, um, rubber. It's, a, it's a, an incredible plant-based leather that I normally, I've been very edgy about plant-based leather because a lot of it's been plastic. And when I see a company doing this work, they're using this cotton as the backing. And then they're using a rubber that they source very carefully for the surface. So we have plant-based leather, tampons, bedding, Carhartt, <laughs> Reformation. They're all working together so that the farmer, when he harvests, he or she harvests, all that cotton goes to market. We don't just take the cream of the crop for the textile. We found a market for every fiber quality. So transitioning to wool. Here's an example in our community of one of the 194 small artisanal wool growers in the region, Sarima, uh, Sarima Merch. She's in Bolinas, California. She raises about 20 head. She has a background in corporate sustainability and now has gone back to her husband's family farm and is raising sheep. She works on printmaking and yarn development and design. And this is primarily who we see in the community who is holding up really amazing genetics. The Jacob sheep, the Shetlands, the Icelandic sheep, all of these rare genetics that produce wool that's already dyed. <laughs> the industrial wool systems use white wool and then dye it. But these small flock owners are keeping these breeds alive where you don't need dye. We work with mid-scale ranchers. This is Bodega Pastures in Sonoma County. Um, you can see all the diversity of color. 
we work with larger scale growers, sorry, on 17,000 acres. This ranch produces all the wind power that goes into San Francisco. They're adjacent to the city and they graze sheep on these, these are the rangelands. This is where we're doing the compost applications that I talked about earlier. Out of those landscapes comes these pieces. This is Atelier Herderin, um, Alex Herderin. This is the work she's been making out of climate beneficial wool. So between the small scale growers and the larger scale growers, we've been able to figure out the supply chain. In 2017, we made our first cloth using old Draper looms. It was the first time we had mechanically woven cloth since 1892. So we're starting to make our own cloth sourced back from these ranches. This is Bodega Pastures uh, with Beth, um, who's making durable goods out of the shearling hides, and then also using the cloth and making cots. She's an industrial designer from San Francisco. And every time these artists purchase this cloth, a point of sale goes back into our carbon farm seed fund. And we move 100, it's not a lot, but right now it's 100,000 a year in small grants. And we start paying for things like native grass seeding on the ranches where the wool is sourced. Pollinator belts, that's a one mile pollinator belt near the Great Basin where it's very dry. Um, this is on a sheep ranch. Beaver analogs, slowing, spreading, and sinking the water on these ranches. As the snowpack disappears, we need to capture as much rain as possible. So we make dams that are like what beavers would make. We make habitat that beavers can live in. And then we have a new law that allows us to move beavers to ranches <laughs> to help actually be the keystone species that beavers are. Beavers are hydrologic, hydrologic engineers. They are critical for the sustainability for all of us. So we do the analogs and then we import the beavers once the habitat's established for them. Herbari her, uh, herbarian, herbarian herbaceous cover, I have a hard time pronouncing that, putting native wildflowers, forbs, and grasses back in these sheep pastures, um, making compost at scale, and that's a redwood tree silvo pasture in the top right corner. The other way, and I just want to check time. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to make sure I have time for questions. The other way in which we're working in our community is I was trained a lot by um, a, a wonderful woman who had studied in depth um, back in the 1980s. She was interviewing Mono elders, Chumash elders, Yurok and Karuk elders. In the 80s, she was interviewing these women who were 100 years old. So they remembered the turn of the last century in their tribes. They remembered salmon runs. They remembered grinding rocks for acorn. They knew where all the sacred ceremonial sites were. She compiled a book called Tending the Wild. And what she trained me to think through was something that's very familiar to all of us. The delta between the consumer and the landscape. The farther that delta stretches, the farther or the more opportunity we have to create a chasm of exploitation. And the more we create a psychology in the consumer where the shopping basket takes over from the historic force that the gathering basket once had. We shop for things that we once gathered for. We get home from shopping, but we had nothing to do with the creation of that which we have shopped for. And so we are left with a void. When we actually have to gather those materials, go back to our community and make something functional in our community together, we are filled with something that's hard to explain and it changes our psychology, which changes our appreciation for that material good. And so it lasts longer because we care about it and we're nurtured by a process of making our material culture together. And then we see the land regenerating before our eyes or degenerating. We have the immediate feedback loop about our actions. And so what we try to do in these small ways, because a lot of people say, I don't have access to land, which is a lot of people. I don't have access to sheep. I can't grow these things. I'm not a farmer. How do I engage? And so we've opened up 
on a, tr a land trusted landscape, a small learning center where we're just having mending events. It's very simple. Many of you are probably already involved in this kind of work yourselves. But like, that's how this sweater came to be. I just got involved in sitting around mending it and I went to Thursday mending bars. We serve wine, we have cheese, and we mend our clothes. <laughs> and here's an outdoor mending event. Oh, I don't know if you can see this, but when the mushrooms, we had a beautiful precipitation year. We had a cadre of fungal activity. We invited people to the ranch to do mushroom dyeing. And those colors, we got the entire rainbow from the mushrooms. Again, forage material from landscapes that we watch regenerate. We weren't out harvesting on public lands where we don't know who else is coming and harvesting and who else is harvesting. We're watching the system for its regenerative capacity, bringing people to come and do this work in community, and then offering clothing swaps where people can come and bring whatever they want and trade. So creating a sense of novelty, and beauty through exchange without putting a price tag on it. And then we were also told, because we were working a lot in a community of seven million people in the Bay Area, and we're, now people are coming from all over that region to our learning center. So now we have children's corners. So we make sure that single moms, single dads can come. They, the kids can go out and play with wool and mom and dad can come and do all our workshops. So we're now offering childcare for free and doing art projects and so some kids stay with their moms <laughs> and do the mending with family. And then we also show how you can do, do things traditionally like furoshiki, the art of carrying glass bottles in cloth or books or giving gifts with your cloth wrapped in it. So the idea is that you're using pieces of fabric that might be considered waste and then you're using it as a, as a beautiful item that you can then turn into a gift or just transport your goods. So I had mentioned we are on Coast Miwok land. We also leave the learning center available for workshops that have nothing to do with my ancestors. So everyone of European descent steps back. We serve water, we serve food, we, we do what is asked. We bring play, a safe place for the tribe to come and recreate their traditional regalia or craft. And so we had a few classes um, based in California regalia. Multiple tribal communities came together and informed each other about their traditional regalia, about how they made it, what kind of feathers were used, what kind of skins and hides, and they recreated the feather headdresses. And this is um, Kashaya Pomo, Kos Miwok, Sierra Miwok, um, all influenced in the different headdress styles. So this headdress, I forgot to say, is put together with something called uh, native hemp. So in California, we don't have a cannabis sativa that's native. We have our own native hemp, um, whose Latin name I'm forgetting. It was grown in five square miles in California. Five square miles of one crop. It was used for fish weirs. It was used to tie abalone pieces together for the yokes of initiatic dresses for young women. Um, it was used for almost everything you needed to bind things together. But think five square miles. The Kashaya Pomo man who is restoring some of these areas tells me, we had industrial level outputs of fiber in our community. You know, here you come and you grow this cotton and you grow this wool. We were producing far more fiber per acre than you're producing now. And we had far more of it condensed. Yes, we had industrial levels, like what you, your term of industrial. So it's a very eye-opening experience because where this dog bang or hemp is grown this is a visual we created to show. These are all wildflower patches in a mosaic patchwork, which is also the seeds that were used for 80% of the diet of the tribes in our community was plant-based. It was seeds from wildflowers, seeds from grasses, and it was greens. The understory of all these oak savannas and coastal prairies had all the greens needed 
to create a very virtuous plant-based diet for the most part, only 20% of the diet was animal-based. And so that is a, like hearkening back to this oak savanna as a major source of plant-based protein, mirrored by then <laughs> fiber farming. And so that fiber, um, we grow it at the Learning Center and it's used in those classes. So we are rebuilding our freshwater creek with all of the plants used that can then be harvested by the tribe and used for their coursework. Um, the other thing about this crop, it was burned. And if nature didn't set fire to it, the people would set fire to it. Where the hemp was grown in Sonoma County, did you watch the Sonoma County fires in 2017? Out of the Mayakama Mountains into Kofi Park in Santa Rosa? That's the old dog bang patch. So the, tr the people knew for 13,000 years, that's a fire corridor. Don't put your houses there. Put the plants that co-evolved with fire there. So just another piece of wisdom that we learn from fiber systems when we pay attention to their history. And I'll, I'll end with um, a few more slides. Our vision for the future is the synergy between the indigenous communities, the wisdom that they hold around fire, how to respect and retain the value of the ecology of the oak savanna, while also centering decentralized renewable energy powered manufacturing systems that do allow our wool, because some areas we cannot burn the way we burned a thousand years ago. There's too much density of human population. So California has put $90 million into prescribed herbivory so that we can pay grazers, young people, to go out and contract graze these landscapes. They call them WUI, um, Wilderness Urban Interface Zones. They cannot be burned, but can be grazed. And we can do it ecologically to protect the wildflowers and the perennial grasses, but then we have all this wool. So the vision is we decentralize the manufacturing for scouring and for spinning, and we keep that in the region, and we process our own textiles. And this would be, um, this is for actually for cotton systems. We think a very shrinked acreage of cotton, um, we're already there, <laughs> actually, we've shrunk from a million acres to 136,000. Cotton, Gossypium hirsutum, Gossypium barbadens still have a role some of the genetics in California harken back to a 6,000-year-old genetics from the Tiwa Pueblo people, the Akela cottons that were grown pre-colonization. Some of those desert cotton genetics are still in the cottons we're growing. Amongst all the genetic splicing and dicing and seed monopolies, we still have the ancient genetics hiding inside all of our cotton seed. So I think rebirthing the classical breeding, bringing back the true desert cottons into parts of California does make sense. Um, and then we also are thinking about decentralized manufacturing of that cotton. And I'm ending with a thank you, and I would love to see a hand raise of all the people who are doing their own fiber shed work in their home communities. Could you raise your hands? Look around the room. <laughs> um, could we hear what fiber shed you're from? Okay. Yes. I'm looking at the Colorado fiber shed and we're just at the very, very base level of understanding who we are, what our farms are, what fibers are we here. And I think we connected with the local fiber sheds Mountain Beautiful. Plains and Western Slope. These are the two uh, fiber sheds in Colorado. Thank you, Sonali. I, I didn't realize it had to be a fiber shed community, so I'm so sorry. You are in one. I'm sure you are. <laughs> New York. New York Textile York, Lab. But yeah. Yes, in New York, but it's more of a community in my community where we are doing like the mending and all of these things. And You're a fiber shed. So it's a noun. <laughs> it's a noun as much as it is anything else. Oh, we have an affiliate program so we can really move, you know, micro grants and network. But the vision is we are not dictating your version of a fiber shed because that would be how we got into this problem in the first place is telling other people what to do. So <laughs> the whole goal is you build it up. 
how you envision it. It's your place, it's your people, it's your community, it's your land, it's your soil, it's your arc of color, it's your arc of texture. Let that emerge. So you are in a fiber shed. Yes. <laughs> Was there other hands? Yes. I have a Western Slope, Colorado fiber shed. If and what was your name? I'm Hannah Stratton in Hotchkiss. in Hotchkiss. Growing flax this year, marigolds, and you're going to weave your own flax. Yes, and then we're doing a one-year, one-outfit project. We're just starting now. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else want to say? Yes. Yeah. We're doing, um, we are capturing carbon and food waste out of the community and low food access communities and building soil. And we're, we're looking at how we can um, continue moving into microenterprise in these communities where we start growing stuff um, that create, that is fiber based, but right now we're really food based. We're growing food in those areas. And what region are you in? We're in Denver, in Montbello. Montbello, beautiful. Great to start with food waste. Yes. I was in a high desert fiber shed. High desert fiber shed. And they do mending circles, I believe. Yeah, I, that's, that's all that I'm aware of. I'm not too, I've done and there's some great grazing that, that is happening, too. Yes? Uh, we're for fiber providers for the mountains and plains, fiber shed that's just getting started. And I actually had a question about um, your climate beneficial verification program. Is that just specific to California, or is no. that going to be? Can be we're extending the climate beneficial program to anyone who wants, like in Ireland, the, this group, the Irish, my ancestors' traditional territory is building their own fiber shed, which is the most soulful experience for me. I'm like, oh, Ireland, <laughs> you have amazing wool and linen, and I'm hoping you rebirth it. They're starting a climate beneficial program, and we're just lending science and support, and really the team at CSU is a lot of our support. So. Reach out to Lexi at Fibershed and just say, you know, you spoke with Rebecca and because we're helping the New York Textile Lab start their uh, climate beneficial program. They have multiple carbon farm plans and we have a, we thankfully with CSU, the um, team from National Center of Appropriate Technology, Seed to Shirt, which is the black cotton growing community in the southeast, the New York Textile Lab the Northern Great Plains wool growers, we got a $30 million grant from the USDA to scale the program nationally this year. We just signed papers two days ago with the hackers, yes. <laughs> so yes, um, we are very available and you could join the program that we're kind of generating or start your own. We're happy to help at whatever level works best for your community. Um, any other fiber shed organizers you wanna mention? Thank you. And you've made an incredible open source spinning and car. Yes, we built an open source spinning machine. Uh, it's all 3D printed. And it's like small scale. Um, anybody can operate one. So farmers, that's the goal is to get farmers to actually start spending their own bills. Amazing. Can we access the plans now or soon? Yeah, we're going to uh, present, I think, in July. At the micro grant? Okay, so if you aren't already part of a fiber shed community and you want to find an organizer, uh, our website, fibershed.org, has 64 national and international community organizers. We've, we've attempted and tried to focus on uh, leads in each community who want to work as organizers with multiple producers. And so, you know, if they, the, the challenge with all the work is capacity and having enough capacity. And so one of my goals is to build out um, pipelines of funding for every organizer. Right now it's just through micro grants, but um, those are available every year. And if you don't have an organizer in your community and you want to organize as a group or as an individual holding that space, I always recommend doing it in a group, if you can, or small group. It works really well. Um, the Southeast Fiber Shed community just incorporated as a 501c3, and they are big into flax production. And they actually have a history of, with European settlement, though, of flax. Um, flax becomes linen, of course. 
And Brazil is now doing their fiber shed work, and I'm very excited because they have one of the most dynamic ecotype, um, e more dynamic ecotypes than any fiber shed that I think I'm aware of. Um, Pocucho cottons and rubber <laughs> and everything under the sun. North England has been organizing for a while, and they're doing an open call for producers. Mainly what people are doing is trying to lift up their place by putting lists of the manufacturers, the artists, the makers, the designers, the farmers in one place. So if you're a textile design student, you know, you could go and say, oh, I want to actually make from this place, and you could access that resource through lists. And that's mainly what the fiber shed communities are trying to do is um, erase the erasure, <laughs> like put everyone back on the map, basically. Um, last slide, Mountains and Plains Fiber Shed. I love the Pablo Neruda quote, beauty is twice beauty and what is good is doubly good when it is a matter of two socks made of wool. <laughs> and um, Nordenfieldska Fiber Shed um, in Norway also doing very incredible work. So you can follow all of these hyper-local place-based communities on Instagram. If you're on Instagram, it's a great way to start searching and watching all these people invigorate these grassroots movements. And I hope that I have opportunity to connect with you all in this work. Did you have your hand raised? Yes. Welcome to Mountains and Plains Oh. I'm Mary Rose. I'm the chair. This is Jessica. She's the secretary. We've reorganized. That post was from the last um, organizers. Luckily, they did all the work for us and made us a nonprofit. We just reorganized. If anybody's a producer, we have a list of local producers. It's forty dollars a year to list with us, um, and we'll put you on our website as a yarn producer, a human repair of cycle design. Thank you, Bailey, and good to see you. <laughs> and. You know, on that note, I'm happy to answer questions and or have you ask questions to the organizers in the room. Um, Sonali, do you feel like we should do that for a few minutes or should we yeah, just... No, we have time, I think. Yeah. We have about 15 minutes and then we all head down and we can still continue these conversations. Wonderful. Yeah, I'm happy to take questions then if you have any um, about this work or as I mentioned, the organizers in the room, if you have questions for them. Or, yeah, I'm also happy to handle hard questions. I love those, so. <laughs> so not a real hard question. Um, thank you so much. Great presentation. Um, beautiful presentation. Thank you. About the Cotton and Climate Coalition, if I'm yes. remembering the name correctly, that you were, and the partners include Outer Known and Reformation and Kaiuchi and um, Carhartt, et cetera. Do, and they're funding this. Is the cotton then that is grown eventually just committed to those brands? And how, how does that work? It's a very good and question. And then do they buy, are they buying it then also, right? So mm -hmm. they're not. Yes, so there's the way that the mechanics or the architecture of the project is that the brands are actually paying for a level of education. We have something called the coalition. And we do go into pre-colonial history, water, labor rights, like just so people understand the landscape that they're in. The science is updated constantly by Dr. Daly or other agronomists. And, and so you're part of the coalition is resensitizing yourself through science and through literature and through history of place. And then the other part is the fiber purchase. And the incentives for doing that work on the landscape are built into the price of the cotton, which is a very, somewhat revolutionary act in this world <laughs> to not disaggregate and externalize costs or benefits and say, hey, we'll use our sustainability something or other fund to pay for this much of the cotton, but we want to keep buying it at the commodity price. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, we're still debating what we can do. We, we want to scale this work. But right now, so far, we've been able to keep all the price of the cotton internalized to the brands that are working with us are buying that cotton. We still have cotton available though. And we have, thanks to the brands, in the pre-competitive program, which is the program where they all move their cotton through the same mill in the, in the domestic North American US landscape together. And they, make, they basically stay pre-competitive to the yarn stage. 
So they scaffold the mill minimums together. Natural fiber welding is in that, Carhartt is in that, Ref, Reformation's in that, Outer Known is in there. They all move together to yarn, and then they differentiate at the textile. We still have, we want to grow the coalition. We actually have room for more brands, but that pre-competitive program has allowed us to do one thing that's really exceptional, which is the knitter that many of them are using in Los Angeles is actually producing 500 and 1,000 yard minimums that Fibershed, the nonprofit, is buying based on the R&D of Outer Known and Reformation. Right. On their backs, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> we are buying back yardage and then getting it to designers who are part of new collectives that are design students, basically. We were running a design challenge this year through Fibershed. But we're also getting that textile out to young upcyclers in Brooklyn um, who are saying, I've been upcycling forever, but I do kind of sometimes want to work with a virgin material <laughs> that's from a place I can source. Like, just combine it, right? So we've been making sure that this, so this yardage actually will be available in two weeks. And a lot of our wool will be very transparent. That's like 100% lamb's wool fabric, $65 a yard, $80 a yard. This C4 cotton, we're getting at $6.90 a yard because of those brands doing all that work, they're making this available now for the micro design. And we're calling it the micro design community. You could be a student, a one woman man shop. Um, you could be a team of four and you're getting clothes out the door. We want this fabric that's highly innovative, traceable to specific fields with mapping of all the carbon direct measurement in your hands. So that's, I just, that, that, there's so many layers to see for, but one is equity around getting fabric into people's hands who normally get whatever's there and they don't get to make choices. Oh, I don't, I don't know if I have traceable fabric, but this is available. If larger brands want to get involved, we actually need more brands in the coalition. There is more acreage to transition than there is uptake numbers right now. We have more supply than we have demand. And that's, also because we're internalizing all costs. And so it's a slow, organic thing to get businesses to be like, how do we work with these costs? How, how much does it cost to regenerate a whole valley? How does it, much does it cost to regenerate a watershed? How do you buy a, a pair of shoes that internalize that? That's what's getting worked out. So. Thank you. If yeah. you're a micro-scale brand, um, don't have the deep pockets to fund this type of work. Are there other opportunities to contribute to the work through? I would be boots on the ground, even. You know, um, that's how my brand is. So, uh, are there opportunities for involvement from micro, micro scale brands to move it yeah. forward? Yes, enough micro designers would easily be on par with the demand we see of even some of these larger brands. I mean, it's just, Probably it's more so because we've been doing it longer. Yeah, and you know that bumper sticker where they have like a big fish that's made up of all the little fishes? Right. The power of collective organizing, you can get what you, you know, make change through that. If the micro design community did collective organizing and said, yeah, we are in for 15,000 pounds of cotton, we're gonna move that, or we're gonna move 20,000 pounds of cotton. Um, you know, that's like helping restore the biology for 10 acres of land, 15 acres of land. It all matters. So I think, um, yes, you contact us. We would love to, the cotton that's coming, we want to move it <laughs> in yardage. <laughs> so if you like the textile and you want access, we want to get it out the door because it just means more acres we can enroll. Yes. This is Christy Donner. Are they one of the hires of the cotton? Christy Dawn is possibly going to work in our wool program, but early on in their process, um, before we started C4, I introduced them to Nishant Chopra of the Chennai, or he's outside of Chennai, India, and he has the Prakriti fiber shed. And Christy Dawn took a real investment into the acreage in India, and they've put everything into their farm to closet program, financially speaking. So they're just at this point where they're like, okay, let's talk about wool, let's talk about California cotton. Um, they have been, they were part of the initial coalition, but 
I think right now, just the size that they are, how much they are taking on at once. They're just taking off chewable bites. <laughs> but a very wonderful brand working in farm to closet in a very powerful way. And I think we'll see them end up in bioregional specific uh, lines uh, from all over the world because that's kind of how they want to work. They want to work in Peru. Um, they want to work in India. They want to work in their own bioregion. Um, but one step at a time. Yeah. Thank you for that. Any other quest? Yeah. Um, so my question is more focused on educating children. So I'm a handcraft teacher at a Montessori school in Denver. And I teach elementary and middle school students how to knit, crochet, weave, sew, they mend. And I'm, and I'm kind of making up the curriculum as I go. And I'm curious what, if you were to have a class or have access to interested elementary and middle school students, what would you want them to know about fiber shed? I would love them to know that um, their clothes are made out of air and that I'd love them to understand the carbon cycle. And I did write a little curriculum um, about this. It's on our website. Um, if it's not clear where it is, I can, it's like a four part curriculum for second to fourth grade. Okay. Um, and it is about learning how to appreciate an apple, a cotton t-shirt, and um, thinking about fresh carbon and how it affects our bodies and our energy levels and how air turns into energy for us through the power of the sun. Um, that's great fodder for little kids to think about um, the, the physics of the world they inhabit as they come into their bodies and consciousness. I think um, the work of the hands is so important. Um, that our hands stay connected to certain textures. And so having them work with wool um, and learning about different breeds of sheep, I think it just getting them excited about biological diversity as it shows up on farms, as it shows up in natural, you know, unmanaged, unanthropogenically stewarded systems, but just that how abundant our planet is. I think with the little ones, I just want to get them excited, hopeful, they don't need to hear the climate science yet. They just need to fall in love. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes. How do the other customers do, guys, when it comes to wood? Because it means wood normally when it goes through synthetic, it means more some of the process. But how do the uh, local guys in uh, other customers in the aspect of the wood? How do you try to achieve that? Did you say, if I'm repeating the question, I might have gotten it. How is the color fastness dealt with, yeah. both in natural dyes and with the sheep or animals that are? Yeah. Well, all of the effect of UV, um, so on a sheep themselves, when they're lambs, like a black, black sheep, they will get um, bleached by the sun. So when you shear the animal, the out, outer parts of their wool will be this beautiful sun bleached brown black and then closer to their skin will be black. And so we know the sun even just out in the field is bleaching the wool on the animal's back. So we've, we see that the effect of UV light is always changing these colors. Um, how I brought this forward again to like students I've worked with is we want everything, the, the goal of impermanence societally has created so much material culture that is impermanent. We are swimming in impermanence. And I think some of it is like a fear of our own mortality to just let things fade. My hair will change, my skin will fade. I mean, my hair will fade, my skin will be affected by UV. I'm a biological being that will change under UV light. And I know that eventually I hope my body will compost. I think that thinking about our clothes with this similar sense of like, how do we play with the effect of UV light and allow that, that, uh, that dyeing process or bleaching process to actually be part of our designs um, would be a really fascinating thing because no, it's not permanent, but I think that's its beauty and its gift because it be, can be eaten by microbes and not bio persist in our soil systems. And at the end of the day, 
I'm very concerned with biopersistence of fossilized carbon molecules in our soil systems. Timnit Kafala of the Bren School in Santa Barbara said that we, the, uh, the, what we think is happening in the ocean with microfibers and all the dyes that are on the natural fibers that are synthetic, plus the synthetic fibers and the synthetic dyes on those fibers, they think that the, the rivaling, the soils are now at least possibly double the effect we're having in the oceans with microplastics. See that times two in our soils. What does that do to microbes, m metabolic pathways and such? So I just take this look of like, I know it's going to fade. Some people aren't going to like that. But some natural dyers have done incredible work in, per in making something as persistent as possible. And some dyes will. Indigo can be done very beautifully. And some, you know, it can really hold. Black walnut with those high tannin levels can. You know, you're going to see some dyes that are very fugitive. Um, and I don't know, some, you could always say, you know, we could avoid those if that's our goal is more permanence. We could work towards those plants that are going to provide more of it. But we've not really resolved it, I don't think. And, and I used to feel like it was going to be a problem, like I was never going to be able to affect the textile industry because nothing I do is, not that I, nothing I advocate for is permanent. It all becomes microbe food. So it's always very challenging because I always felt like, ah, oh, they're just, they want all this consistency and they want everything to last for a million years. <laughs> so I get it and I just, I think um, we'll work with the design community we can that can accept the realities and the opportunity constraints, opportunities and constraints of the materials we work with. But yeah, no perfect solution. <laughs> yes? Uh, congratulations, Rebecca. This is uh, so um, with the, the coalition that you have uh, with the coaches and the reclamation, as they take uh, the cotton now and they um, go off, what is the commitment in terms of when it's completed and they turn it into clothing or uh, um, what is the commitment to bring it back to the earth again? Um, and could you share a little bit of that? Our commitment is, with some of the coalition members who, again, you'll hear from tomorrow if you're here, um, highly in tune with biodegradability and making a product that will return. Um, and some of the companies are going in with like what you call grage or undyed. They're just taking it right to market undyed. So they're not even going to try to figure out what's going to biodegrade and what's not. Um, we were just having this conversation about our, the goal really is to provide um, more concrete chemistry lists that are toxicolo toxicology oriented so that brands that join these kinds of coalitions both know how to get it composted or can really, I mean, basically in California we're going to start because we have a bill SB 1383 that writes textile compostability into the law. And so we have to get all our organic material out of landfill by 2030. It's a legal mandate. So clothing has to be composted. So I think with the California headquartered brands, you know, the outer knowns, Koyuchis, I think it, there's a power in that they're headquartered there. They might be able to say, yeah, let's, let's actually get this composted with some of our local customers in our local composting, which actually one of our cotton farmers runs a 20 acre composting facility. And he is on every call <laughs> with every compost scientist we can drum up because he wants to take back all of what C4 is making in product. I mean, some of the brands are in different parts of the country and some of the consumers or wearers are in different parts of the country. So we'll need to find composting solutions across the country. But one of the things with C4 is that we have a farmer who can do that composting at scale, wants to do it, and wants to return the carbon to his very cotton field. So we have biological circularity close at hand. There's a lot of little details, and we're working through them. But the main concern would be if a brand does use anything that we just don't know its effect in soil. We really want to, on the front end, do kind of precautionary principle analysis on that. And I just found out today that's happening within the coalition, and I didn't even really understand there was other coalition members actually moving that forward as much as, you know, Canon Michaels, the farmer, and I are moving it forward. 
So cross your fingers, you'll buy something with a, bi a tag that says legally biodegradable, compostable. Yeah. <laughs> this is a different, yes, yeah, different.